Hi, I'm Bruce Pattinson from the Total Education Centre. I hope you enjoyed today's lecture and don't forget that these lectures are brought to you free. So if you give us a like, that'd be great. And don't forget, if you have any questions or any queries, click on the button below, write me a question, and we'll surely get back to you as quickly as possible. Don't forget, if you're a subscriber to our channel, you can get to select the videos that you want to have made. And if you really need some extra help, don't forget, go to our website, because on the website you have all the student notes and teacher notes for the topics that I'm lecturing on. These lectures are only in addition to those and they'll give you all the detail that you require to do well in your studies. Thanks for watching and we hope you enjoy the video. The wild swans at cool. The trees are in their autumn beauty. The woodland's paths are dry. Under the October twilight, the water mirrors a still sky. Upon the brimming water among the stones are nine and fifty swans. The 19th autumn has come upon me since I first made my count. I saw before I had well finished all suddenly mount and scatter wheeling in great broken rings upon their clamorous wings. I have looked upon those brilliant creatures and now my heart is sore. All's changed since I, hearing at twilight the first time on this shore, the bell beat of their wings above my head trod with a lighter tread. Unwearied still, lover by lover, they paddle in the cold, companionable streams or climb the air. Their hearts have not grown old. Passion or conquest wanders still where they will, attend upon them still. But now they drift on the still water, mysterious, beautiful. Among what rushes will they build? By what lake's edge or pool delights men's eyes when I awake some day to find they have flown away? Hello, I'm Bruce Pattinson and welcome to this lecture on Yeats' poem, Wild Swans at Cool. You've just heard the poem being read to you, and now I'd like to go into a deeper analysis of the poem and the meaning behind it. Yeats' original idea for the poem came about, as he tells us, in his autobiographies. I must have spent the summer of 1897 at Cool. I was involved in a miserable love affair that had but for one brief interruption absorbed my thoughts for years past and would for some years yet. My devotion might have been offered to an image in a milliner's window or to a status in a museum. My health was giving way, my nerves had been wrecked. Finding I could not work and thinking the open air salutary, Lady Gregory brought me from cottage to cottage collecting folklore. And so that's where the original idea from Wild Swans at Cool came. Yeats, unhappy, wandering, looking at nature and so these swans are a continual symbol in Yeats's poetry, and we here we see that moored Helen dichotomy that we see the duality of sky and earth in, in each of the poems where he talks about this issue. The wild swans inhabit the two elements, earth and air, and the idea of mortality and immortality fits in perfectly with both of those. We see lots of duality in Yeats and the idea of contrast and comparison. Again, time is a subtle motivator of change, is apparent. Um, again, we can link our essay through time. We also had to link this to his other poems through that idea of time. The swans were part of Yeats' environment and it's important to think about what each stanza represents. And I'd probably like to go through this poem. I don't usually do this, but I might go through this poem stanza by stanza and then we'll have a look at what one of the critics says about it. The first stanza sets the scene in the woodland, and it's autumn, of course, in Lady Gregory's estate. He describes a complete landscape, and he doesn't often do this, but he, when he creates a landscape, he usually does it through atmosphere and description, um, where the water mirrors the sky and parallel to the poet's life where he feels he's in his autumn. Um, despite this winding down, the energy is still there in the stands with brimming and the abstract beauty contrasting to the more concrete images of trees, stones and swans. Um, it's significant we have nine and fifty swans because this is what drives the rest of the poem's um, content. The unchanging nature of the number of swans despite the fact that indiv individual swans might change. The swans are changing and changeless because of this. Again, note the duality of the ideas that deal with the problem of ageing. and That idea of time and ageing, you can link constantly throughout each of the poems. I think it's, it's a great thing to discuss and a very good link that bind all your essay together. Especially if you're talking about some of the different poems and different aspects of the poetry, you can always come back to that to give that poem a sense of flow and unity. The next answer in this poem 
Um, we have the repetition of the word autumn and we get some indications of the time frame of the word 19th since he began the count of his swans. Here we can reflect back on the idea of line length, which represents the movement of the swans, and we get slightly sad feeling as he states his life is also passing with time. Um, the, the reality of the swans coming to life, they scatter, wheeling, clamorous, the word rings, and that, of course, links back to Yeats's philosophy of life um, and the symbols that he uses. And you need to go back and look at the gyres and all those sorts of things I talked about in the very first lecture, that context, and you'll understand that. The third stanza moves away from the swans back into the poet. And while I haven't changed, everything else in the world has, including himself. He says, all's changed. And time has allowed his heart to be sore. The bell beat of the wings is a sound that echoes the end of his youth. And he feels he is no longer the same person that he was 19 years ago. These two stanzas show the relationship between Yeats and the swans before the final two describe how the swans and Yeats contrast their changelessness with the terrible fluxes in his own life. That stanza four then is, is more gently wistful and he wonders at the swans' faithfulness as they go about their business of paddling companionably. There's, there's seemingly a sense in this stanza, I think, of his unrequited love for Maud. Um, critics have argued back and forth about that. It's what you think. I, I think there's that sense there, but it depends on what you think. And as you know, you need to formulate your own opinions. Um, in the final stanza, there's a feeling of calmness and acceptance with still water. And the final imagery conveys the mysterious, beautiful nature of the flux and the fixedness of life. The swans will pass on and delight others. And Yates realises he's not like them and comes to accept this as one day they'll have flown away. In many ways in this poem, the swans become a symbol of youth. And, they, and while they are forever changing, um, there's some constancy about them and he points that out too. The swans can certainly do things he can't do, and, um, but they are still subject to the laws of nature as we all are. It's also um, significant that the swans represent um, in mythology and tradition, strength, purity, fidelity and immortality. And Yeats seems to have used each of these in the poem and as links to the other poems. So that's basically a quick rundown of, of, of Wild Swans at Cool. And it's an interesting poem in the fact that it does contain all those ideas and how we think about things and fix to those ideas. So let's see what one critic says about it. Um, Herbert Levine, in his article, Freeing the Swans, Yeats's Exorcism of Maud Gone, points out clearly that um, this version, the final version of the poem, is the one we're studying. The Yeats printed in 1919 is no longer an ode to a private memory, as the initial drafts were, but rather the poet's symbolic vision. Instead of concluding with the image of the swans as his private possession, Yeats projects a concluding vision that acknowledges their autonomy as mysterious, beautiful beings that the poet can never truly know, despite his earlier attempts to count and personify them. And he goes on to, to give a, a deep analysis of the final six things. And then he says, the final stanza opens after um, the invidious comparisons between Yeats's heart and the swans have been drawn. And he goes back to then talk about Maud gone. So that's something to think about. And you might like to just consider that when you think about the poem. That's really all we have time for in this analysis of, of um, Wild Swan. So have a think about it. Any questions, please ask. I'm Bruce Pattinson. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. Goodbye for now.